so um, hopefully all can see my slide. Um, so this is, I know I'm the last thing between you and like, I don't even know, a lot of gin and tonics after two days of Zoom. So um, thanks for sticking it out and being here um, with me for this last little bit. Um, so what this is, is it's a conversation for postdocs and early career faculty in particular. Um, I see that I have some um, colleagues on here that certainly know um, every bit as much as I do on the line too. So I hope you will chime in at any time that you see fit to chime in. Um, so I'm a professor at the Colorado School of Mines. Um, I spent a few years with the US Geological Survey and then my, my pre-tenure tenure years and then one year post-tenure at Penn State um, before moving to um, School of Mines. And so what I'm gonna talk about here, I'm gonna give you a few slides based on the feedback you guys gave me already from the poll and then it's an open discussion for the rest of time because I figure people will have questions. I just want to make an important caveat though that everything here that is on these slides is like my two cents and that does not make it right. <laughs> and so by all means um, accumulate as much information as you can about some of these questions from other from peers, from mentors, from other colleagues who may give you different answers and the truth if there is one is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, one thing I just thought I would do um, to get started is find out who's here with me. So um, I threw up this little poll just to see who's with me. So I have a sense of, awesome, okay. That's looking pretty good. So here's what we got. So um, not surprisingly, most of the people here are postdocs and uh, pre-tenure faculty members, which is awesome. The rest of you are totally welcome. It's great to have you here. And I look forward to your um, opinions and questions as we get going. All right, so here's what I got back. So we sent out a poll to everyone who had registered sort of a week, um, you know, a week before the, the, um, the meeting. So apologies if you weren't a part of that. And we asked for a few questions in terms of what you are most interested in. And so um, some of the feedback that we got was on thing like, like balancing or maybe to use rules words, um, harmonizing, <laughs> uh, proposal writing, research, teaching and service. Um, got some questions about how to brand oneself or to highlight your research, building networks, recruiting students, which I saw in some ways is all being under the same umbrella, which I'll just call branding. Um, so getting the word out about yourself, um, some questions on effective mentoring, um, some questions on the interview process itself. And then a couple people actually mentioned the effects of the pandemic, which I don't have specifically addressed here, but we can certainly talk about as a group of folks um, as we go forward. So um, let's cut to the chase. We only have so much time, right? So here is my thoughts on this. I also run a new faculty workshop here at Mines, um, and I first uh, taught something like this with Jeff McDonald, who's at the University of Saskatchewan. So um, a lot of this is motivated by um, that first um, panel with him. But the end of the day, when we think about universities, they are political environments. And it's not the brightest people who are always the most successful. Um, there is a process through tenure, right? And there are a lot of rules, uh, many of which are unwritten. And I'm happy to be as transparent and honest about those as I can be. And I have colleagues here on the line that I hope would do the same. Um, you know, there's obviously networking and schmoozing and all of these sorted details that I think sometimes feel very mysterious that um, I'm happy to try to share at least my perspective on that. Um, but I do want to say it is an amazing place to work. So for those of you that are already early career, I promise you it gets better. <laughs> for those of you who are thinking about going into academics, it is such an interesting space to be where you have such amazing freedom and the opportunity to work with some really incredible people, including your students. And so I hope that I can encourage you to think about this path um, if right now it feels like one that is a little overwhelming. There's plenty of other great jobs out there also, but, um, but this one is, is, is interesting and I think is, I've been very lucky to be in it. All right, so let me just put one slide up to sort of set the stage, which is when you are hired or were hired, you were hired based on your potential, right? Where you could go. And you're going to be promoted based on your performance, right? So this idea is that you're hired based on the fact that you are going to launch. They want you to like do amazing things. And there's a million ways to do amazing things. There is no right way to tenure. 
there are um, things that will certainly help you along that path, um, but there isn't one path to get there. Um, and what someone is going to look at in sort of six years after you start as an early career faculty member is, is the, the composition of your file, right? And so that performance um, is what you're going to be evaluated on. And there are three key areas, right, that you will be evaluated on. That's your teaching, your research, and your service. And that allocation or that load will depend a lot on the institution you are at, maybe even the department you are in. And what you want to do as soon as you can is figure out what those sort of local productivity metrics look like. So um, what are you expected? Are you expected to be 40% research, 40% teaching, 20% service? Are you 80% teaching and 10% research and 10% service? It would be worth talking with your department head and also with peers in your department and broadly around your institution about what that allocation might look like because that is your internal expectations for promotion and tenure. Now, the thing to think about is that outside reviewers often don't know that allocation. Sometimes it's explicit in a tenure file, and you can always make it explicit. One thing I want you to think about with this whole process of tenure, it is your story to tell. You have the opportunity in your tenure packages to tell the story that you want to tell, and you can shape that in any way you want. And so all of the things that might feel to you right now like, maybe they didn't go the way you wanted them to exactly, you can spin that yarn. And um, I, I know we don't have a ton of time here and I would be happy to talk more with any of you about that at any time, but you're the one that gets to tell the story of how all of these pieces, your teaching, your research, your service fit together. And I bet if we come back to Crystal Eng's talk, for those of you who saw her, she talked about how she got some pushback pre-tenure about working on something that was sort of very service related around her work with, with tribes. Um, I'm sure that she was able to tell a story in her promotion and tenure package that made it clear why exactly she was doing the work that she was doing. So the good news is, is that if you know what the sort of guidelines are, it can be more stress-free. It's a lot more stress-free than not knowing what you're aiming for. And so being able to get some data on that space is going to be a a huge relief to you, even if I, I mean, I know that whole process is stressful no matter what you do. No one goes through the tenure process and is like, fun, right? So, um, but the more information you can get on that, the better. Um, one thing I think that very few places talk about um, or acknowledge, but is true, is the balance around money. And so, um, let me bring that up for a second. And again, we'll have plenty of time to talk about these things. You can also interrupt me at any time. Um, so I think in most universities, money, talk, money talks, and there are some examples, certainly, especially at big, you know, research one universities, where some more marginal P&T dossiers succeed when someone has brought in a lot of money. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that in your promotion and tenure file, so external to your home institution, money doesn't really say anything. What people are interested in is what you did with that money. What is the impact of your research? And that's what people will evaluate you on. Very few people will take a look at your dollar value and say like, let's definitely promote Pam for the, all that money she brought in. So they're going to take a look at your, your paper uh, productivity and the impact of those papers are, is the work that you're doing changing um, the field that you are in? Um, are people inspired by your work? Um, what is your leadership role within your disciplinary area? So, um, so that I find, I found to be a very tricky thing pre-tenure is how to think about money. And um, in the end, I thought of it as a way to like publish papers, right? And in fact, when I was at Penn State, a metric they sort of informally talked about at times was actually papers per dollar. Um, and so, uh, so for people that don't bring in any money, which it's, you know, at times, Holly may have some, some insight on this too. It feels to many people that it is harder to get funding than it was. And I'm sure that's true if we want rewind 50 years. Um, but if you don't bring in a lot of money, but you're still doing excellent work, that's amazing, right? That's a metric in its own right. And so, um, so money is a thing that um, we think about. So my next big you know, take home, I guess, though, is that research not published is research not done, right? So for most of us, the most important thing we can do pre-tenure um, is, is write papers. Um, and so getting that out there is the way that we um, demonstrate the sort of impact that we've had on our fields. Now, for many people, the reason we don't publish more than we do um, has to do with um, uh, the sheer number of things that are on top of you when you are pre-tenure. But um, there's a great uh, book I meant to point it out. I showed you this, um, the cover of it, um, which is by Boyce that came out in 2000. And I'll, I'll put the link in the chat box when we're done. 
Um, but teaching is a primary deterrent for many early career faculty because they really want to do a good job on it. Um, there are many people that will spend 30 hours a week on their teaching duties in their first years uh, based on data that's in this book. And, um, and that's quite a lot when you're trying to only work 40 hours a week, right? Um, and so some common things that you see from early career um, faculty from new teachers is that they put way too much material into their lectures. For those of you that are farther down the line, you probably remember doing this. My lectures have gotten thinner and thinner and thinner through the years where I focus only on you know, maybe one key idea in any class these days. I no longer try to teach the chapter um, of the book, which I certainly did when I started. So we often present too much material. We present it too quickly. And that keeps students from being able to interact or ask questions, kind of like what I'm doing to you now. Um, we don't spend enough time explaining the, rel the relevance of why we're teaching what we're teaching. And um, another problem can be that we don't realize that for those of us that end up in academia, many of us were exceptional learners. Um, our paths may not have been circuitous, but many of us were still really exceptional in the way that we take in information. But that might not be the case for many of our students. And so this is sort of an aside because most people asked about research and teaching, but because um, or research and funding, because teaching is such a big piece of what we do, I felt like it was important to just suggest one thing to early career people, which is to think about active learning, not only for all the pedagogical reasons that you've probably already been told are a good reason um, to do active learning exercises, but the other is that it just slows you down. And so um, by stopping and making your class do something, um, it allows them to sort of take some of the material that you've been putting at them into their brains. Um, and it gives you a moment to sort of think about what in this class is really important. Do I really need them to memorize, you know, four different types of hydrologic storage today? Or do I need them to think about how much water comes out of an aquifer? And so can I ask a question of them that they can solve in class together to sort of think through that problem as a hydro example? Um, of course, writing scares people off without having the excuse of teaching too, right? So for many of us, we're scared of, of writing. Um, again, from this, this voice book, which is a totally outstanding book, even though it's old, um, talks about some, some dominant thinking patterns of faculty that struggle to write. And some of the things that you see are, and you may recognize yourself in these, because I certainly recognize myself in some of them, um, perfectionism. My, uh, my PhD advisor, um, I was, I am still a bit of a, a perfectionist. I've gotten better as I've gotten older, uh, but my PhD advisor at one point, I was just dragging my feet on my first paper out of my PhD. I wanted it to be perfect. I kept thinking there was a new way or a better way to do something. And at one point he said to me um, that publishing a paper is contributing to the conversation. It is not the period at the end of the sentence. And if you come up with a better way to do something in six months, he said, you can write another paper. And I actually thought that was really helpful advice at that time for me, for someone who felt like my paper had to be perfect to go out there to instead think about it as contributing to the conversation. Um, I think many of us think about criticism and rejection, and no one enjoys that. Of course, this, this career path is full of criticism and rejection, and so I think many of us get thicker skins, but it doesn't make it pleasant ever for anyone, right? And so that idea of putting a lot of time into something and, um, and being rejected is not super fun. Um, or thinking of writing itself as a difficult or unrewarding unre process, right? And coming back to Rule's idea of like, how do we like, restructure our brains like how do we reward ourselves to you know to think of writing as fun it's like a, a whole thing i don't even know how to do but um but these are common common traits and what i want to show you is some data from this book because one of the things i thought was the most stunning about this particular book was that he showed how progressing in our writing um decreases anxiety and stress which i thought was quite interesting so here's some data from boyce's book what this is is um showing you four different metrics, pages written per week, hours of writing per week, manuscripts submitted, and manuscripts accepted for two different types of writers. And binge writers were basically people that would write when they felt like they had the time or when the moment struck them. And they would say like, okay, now I can write. Now I can write, I'm gonna like binge it out, I'm gonna write. Regular writers were people that set time aside for themselves. There's no right time to set this aside, you know, whether it's in the mornings or maybe it's Mondays or I don't know, maybe it's 
you know, 15 minutes after lunch, whatever it looks like, they would set some sort of regular schedule for themselves. And one of the things that was interesting is that on all of the metrics that were, were um, evaluated that regular writers uh, did, did better than, the, than um, bench writers. And this was even the case with control groups. So I'm not showing you those data, but they are in the book. Um, he actually separated people into groups where some were forced to be regular writers, some were forced to be binge writers, and, um, and measured metrics that way as well. So this is, wasn't just a self-selected process. Um, one other data set that really struck me from that book was um, percentage of times with depression. And um, what this is, is again, looking at regular writers and unplanned writers. Um, I don't know why the labeling here is different, but it is as opposed to binge writers. Um, and so the percentage of time of pe you know, people that have depression um, that were regular writers on the whole, whether it's before they wrote, after they wrote, during while they were writing, um, were, were lower than people that um, were, were unplanned writers. And especially this sort of two days later one really strikes me. There's a giant percentage of people that are feeling sort of depressed a couple days after doing something, um, perhaps having not had the time to come back. And so I do think this idea of, of finding ways to be regular about the way we write will help the way that our brains also feel. Um, and you know, these are data, so take them for what they are. Um, one thing I think that's really funny is that some of us are not motivated by success and not that we're not motivated, but it's just hard to motivate sometimes, right? Um, and there's also been some studies that show that people are more inclined um, to work hard to avoid loss than to strive for rewards. So I'm going to share one website with you that I think is a really funny one. Um, it's a, a website that was created by some behavioral economics folks at Yale. And um, what you can do on this website is basically um, pay sums to a, a charity um, to reach your writing goal, or even better, an anti-charity. So you can basically say, all right, I'm going to be donating 50 bucks to Bubba's Steakhouse, which I hate, um, if I don't actually write my five pages by the end of the week. And so um, that might be something that's of interest to some of you. It's sort of weird to like think about punishing yourself, but, um, but if this is of use to anybody, then I figured I would, I would share it. Um, a couple things on mentorship. Um, so I think that most people would agree that research groups work primarily through the conversations we have with one another and our relationships that we have. And the quality of those interactions really impacts the results that come out of one's research group. And so if I can make one suggestion to early career faculty, it is to put your students and your postdocs first. Um, it's not only for them, but it's for you. And the reason for that is there's this really tightly coupled success loop, I would argue, and this is a slide from my, my colleague Mike Gusef at CU, which is that if your advisees are successful, then that means that they have papers that are successful, and that comes back to the conversation we just had with Holly Barnard that will feed proposals that are successful. And when you have successful proposals, that will mean you get more students, and that cycle continues to move forward, right? And that's the sort of promotion and tenure slam dunk. That's where you would like to be is inside of that loop. And one place to start that is by putting your students and your postdocs first so that they are successful in what they're doing. Um, still to this day, I will drop absolutely everything for a paper draft. Um, if a student sends me a draft, I will drop all of the other things because what really is more important than my students getting this paper out of the door for them and for me? Um, I'm sure there's some stupid thing I'm supposed to do for some committee I'm on, but like it can probably wait until tomorrow. And so I try very hard to prioritize student writing over all other things in my group. I don't know if that works for everybody, but I, I, I think it works for me. And so I thought I would share it. Um, another thing as a segue here is to think about how to manage the reputation of your group, which is basically the segue to branding, right? Which is what some questions that people had. Um, more, so how do you manage that reputation? And there's a lot of other things on here too about the idea of a powerful group. You know, people that can have fun together, people that can deal with problems and talk about their problems, people that have clear decision processes. But I wanna talk specifically about managing reputation since so many of you asked about getting the word out. So um, I think the catch as a pre-tenure person is to, to define your brand, um, to figure out what it is that people think of um, when they think of you or, um, or when they think of you that they're like, oh yeah, I definitely need to put Jordan on that committee. She'd be perfect for that, right? So the trick is to find that optimal research width, right? So if it's really broad, if I told you that I was a you know a hydrogeologist, um, that might be too broad because there's many kinds of hydrogeologists. Um, but if I, you know, was super specific and told you that I only worked on, 
you know, time varying electromagnetics and their application to porous media and hydrogeology, but only in systems that were arid. Maybe, maybe that's too, too narrow of a niche, maybe it's not. Um, but I think in the long run, it's about you thinking about what makes you happy and what story can you tell to define the brand. That brand can be really narrow or really broad as long as you can tell a great story for how it defines you. And so don't think there's a right way or a wrong way, but trying to figure out what do you want people to think about when they think about you um, is, an important, is an important thing. I feel like when I was pre-tenure, not unlike Crystal, I worked on some things that, um, that maybe felt very different than other parts of my work. I worked in and out of Ghana for eight years on um, mercury contamination associated with gold mining. Um, and in the end, I decided that I would tell a story about how I work in heterogeneous hydrologic environments and I use innovative tools to explore those systems. And that was my brand. And it allowed me to stick all of the random things I had done for six years under that singular umbrella, which when you looked at it, maybe felt a little more piecemeal than that. But that was the story that I decided to tell to make it look like a coherent thought process when really I had just fumbled along through those six years, like most people do, working on things that I thought were cool, working with people that I thought were cool or where my funding went. And so that drove a lot of what, um, what I did. And obviously moving beyond your advisor is, um, is important in promotion and tenure packages. So again, you get to decide what are those themes, those questions, the umbrella that you make that defines who you are. Um, get that brand on your website, be explicit, put it on your website, tell people exactly what you do and how that umbrella um, defines who you are and your work. Um, post it on your social media and we'll talk more about social media here in just a second. Um, and you can also get the word out about you and your research group by doing a variety of things. You can organize sessions at conferences or at workshops. Um, you can organize a special issue in a journal that might be around some theme. I strongly encourage you to get some senior faculty to work with you on that so you're not taking on a ridiculous service load of editing people's papers um, pre-tenure. And you can write review papers. Review papers are a great way to sort of stamp what your contribution is in the field get your name out there and they tend to be really well cited. So a review paper might be a really good way to sort of establish your brand um, and team up with key people and key people doesn't mean senior people. The problem with full professors is that most of us are really slow to do things because we're not hungry the way we were when we were pre-tenure. All of my pre-tenure years, my best papers, all of my papers were pretty much with with peers, people that I met in graduate school um, or other early career faculty because they were hungry like I was and we were gonna get things done. And sometimes bringing in senior faculty doesn't always help because we're slow. And so think about who key people are. Maybe it's senior faculty for some things, but maybe it's your peers right now that are gonna help you get those things done and done efficiently and quickly. And can you use meetings? Maybe this one's a little hard because we couldn't see each other in person that much, but um, can you meet new people and say, hey, I really thought your talk was cool and like, I've been working on something similar, like maybe we could just get, you know, a drink someday and talk about it. And so some way to, to um, connect with people and connect with people you like and that you think that you would like to work with. Um, the other thing you can do is you can um, think about sponsoring a, a workshop. Um, NSF sponsors workshops at high success rates. And maybe there's a workshop theme that you wanna think about to bring people together around some specific topical area. And so that might be another way to um, to make connections, establish brands um, that might be helpful to you. Um, I think I only have a few more slides and then I'll um, open the floor up. So think about things that you might wanna talk about. Um, so social media. So um, I think there's some great things about social media and there's some great examples of people who do this really well. Um, but of course, keep in mind that obviously, right? Like everything you say online is public um, and it's gonna reach lots of people that you don't know. And I'm using sort of a Twitter thing here, but right, those like 280 characters or however many we get these days are very flattening. And I would encourage people to assume the recipient will have the worst interpretation. And I say that just because I know too many people who have been hurt by um, posting things on social media that they felt um, did, not, did not come off the way they had intended them to. And so thinking carefully about that sort of space, I think is important as probably most of you know, but. I always think about the fact that my colleagues are watching me when I'm on social media. And in your case, they will write letters for you one day. And so think about what you post, but it is a great way to get your brand out. So if you have sort of branded yourself and you wanna share your papers or you wanna share your conferences or you wanna share um, information that colleagues have sent you about something of interest, um, that might be a really great way to continue to establish that brand and establish it in the minds of people that are watching you online. 
Okay, so a, a you know a, a big picture psychological question here. You know, if you can't be Googled, you know, do you exist? I would suggest that besides your homepage, you put up a Google Scholar page um, as you start publishing. Part of the reason for this is that it is um, how people find other people sometimes. So you're looking for someone with some expertise in a certain area. Um, even, <laughs> you may not want a Google page for this, but it's how people find reviewers too, right? And so um, thinking of how to, again, establish that brand for yourself um, and and get it out there. Google Scholar is another great way to do that. So I certainly encourage you to think about putting up a Google Scholar page um, so that the people, again, are aware of you and your work and uh, in a way that's sort of consistent with other um, people's papers, pages that are out there. And I'm going to give you one more piece of homework from this, um, this session, which is to work on making an elevator speech. Uh, so when we get off the, the call today, um, maybe just spend a few minutes thinking about how would you sell yourself in like 15 seconds with the idea that someday Holly decides to return to NSF and you end up in an elevator with her and she's like, man, I am just loaded in dollars right now and I am trying to give away a giant chunk of money. What is it that you do that you're going to be like, oh, let me tell you what I do, right? And so make sure that you've got that that 15 second spiel and literally practice it because it takes sort of the nerves out of a thing if you know what it is early on um, and that you could, sell, you could sell yourself. What's that brand in 15 seconds? What are those things you're working on? And if they want you to expand, that's great. But what's the short punchy version, almost like the first page of the NSF proposal? What's the part that launches that hot air balloon such that someone's like, I'd like to know more. Okay, so that's enough for me. I tried to address as many things as I could from the um, comments that you guys um, have provided pre-tenure, uh, pre-tenure, pre-cyber symposium. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop talking for a moment and would be happy to chat with anyone who uh, has anything they'd like to share. You're welcome to just turn the mic on. You can chat me. What, what, 